Welcome to the Global Migration Centre Lecture Series Podcasts. This podcast presents Patricia galvao Telesh, member of the United Nations International Law Commission, Professor of International Law at the Autonomous University of Lisbon, and Senior Legal Consultant on International Law at the Legal Department of the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She is also a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. She is a Graduate Institute alumni and is currently Senior Research Fellow at the Global Migration Center. Her conference is entitled Sea Level Rise, Displacement, Migration and Human Rights. The conference is moderated by Professor Vincent Chetay. If you wish to keep informed about our activities, visit our website on www.graduateinstitute.ch slash gmc or visit our Facebook page. The Global Migration Center is a research institution that conducts advanced research and provides policy expertise and publications on the numerous causes, patterns, consequences of global migration. So our main function is to lead policy and academic research, but we are also regularly organizing uh, uh, events, expert meeting, conferences, and the key idea is to offer a unique interface between academia, the international community, and the civic society. And clearly, the topic of today is a, a, a good uh, a, a illustration of the need for uh, improving the interface between academia, international community, and civic society, because climate change and its impact on sea level rise is clearly uh, one of the most uh, important and pressing uh, global uh, uh, issues today. And uh, 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 the idea to refine this to topic uh, through, uh, uh, with a focus on the impact uh, 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 upon displacement, migration, and human rights is also uh, an important uh, topic to be discussed uh, between academia, international community, and civil society. And I'm very pleased uh, today to have uh, uh, with us uh, Professor Patricia galvao Teles, uh, who uh, is uh, currently member of the uh, UN International Law Commission. She's also Professor of International Law at the Autonomous uh, University of uh, Lisbon. And uh, she, uh, among many other uh, functions, she is also member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And uh, I, I must add, on a more personal note, uh, she is also uh, uh, alumni from the Graduate Institute. And during this semester, we have also the chance to have uh, uh, Patricia galvao Telesh as a senior research fellow within the Global Migration Center. So I'm very pleased to have you uh, today uh, to discuss this important issue. Uh, that is particularly relevant to your own work as a member of the International Law Commission uh, because the Commission has recently uh, created a study group on sea uh, level rise in relation to international law and uh, you are one of, uh, of the co-chairs uh, about this important uh, uh, issue uh, and uh, besides of course uh, your involvement in the International Law Commission you have published a lot on many different aspects of international law, self-determination, sovereignty, uh, interaction between treaties, custom, environmental law, state responsibility, and so on. So this is a great advantage for us to have you uh, here uh, uh, to discuss uh, uh, sea level rise uh, uh, in the context of displacement, migration, and of course, uh, to know more about the work you are doing uh, in, uh, within the International Law Commission of the United Nations. Thank you very much again to be here, and uh, I'm very pleased to give you the floor. Um, I hope I'm not muted, so I hope you can hear me. Thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure uh, to be with you today um, and um, to be, um, uh, as you said, um, this spring uh, visiting fellow at the Global Migration Center. 
um, at the Graduate Institute. Of course, uh, due to the current situation, this uh, visiting stay ended up by being a virtual uh, visiting stay. Um, I, we were just commenting, um, I had my boarding ticket, not only the plane ticket, but my boarding pass um, on my hands. And last, last minute, uh, I had to cancel my stay, uh, which was supposed to start uh, beginning of March when we saw that the situation, the pandemic situation was going to be a um, difficult period um, in Europe at the time. And so unfortunately, I had to cancel um, my, my physical stay, but um, and, and it's in that context that this lecture uh, was supposed to have happened um, end of March. Um, I've been uh, using anyway the opportunity to do online research and to have some contacts. Um, of course, it's not the same thing as being in Geneva and especially being at my alma mater, the Institute, but um, I've had uh, the opportunity of participating um, during this visiting um, in some online events. And today I'm very happy to um, uh, share um, some thoughts with you in the format of this lecture and on the current work that I'm doing uh, regarding sea level rise and the question of uh, displacement, migration, and human rights. Um, in the context of the uh, International Law Commission. And that was also you know, the object of uh, my visiting stay um, at the Institute was to carry out research for a report I'm preparing uh, for early next year and also to um, benefit from uh, the excellence of the Global Migration Center and its members um, uh, to discuss um, uh, exchange ideas and also to be in touch uh, with many colleagues uh, in the different um, in international uh, organizations and other stakeholders in Geneva, because Geneva is really, for this topic, uh, Geneva is really the place to be. And I hope uh, that um, in the near future, I'll be able to uh, go back again and resume the plans and, uh, and carry on the research plan for, for the report. So um, for the purpose of my talk and in order to make your um, um, uh, your life easier. I've presented um, some, um, I've prepared some PowerPoints um, uh, that I'm going to share um, on the screen so that it will make it easier for you to follow. Um, and then uh, we'll come back uh, for um, a moment of discussion. And I'll be very happy to uh, engage um, in a discussion with you, Professor Shetai, but also with our um, participants that I hear um, are following um, our events. Uh, so um, uh, what um, I, I intend to do today is mainly to um, explain a little bit uh, what uh, we are doing at the International uh, Law Commission regarding this topic of sea level rise. And then I will focus, of course, um, in particular uh, on the question of um, displacement, migration, and human rights, or what we've been calling, and I'll explain that, protection of persons affected by sea level rise, which is the part of the topic that I am responsible for. Um, so just to um, uh, set the, a bit the stage, um, I um, will start by showing you uh, the cover of Time magazine from uh, almost a year ago. Now, um, I'm sure many of you have seen it, and um, uh, the Secretary General um, after, uh, of the UN, after a visit to the Pacific Island region, and uh, made the cover of Time magazine uh, with this photo that I think it's quite emblematic in the sense that uh, uh, it shows that uh, sea level rise as one of the adverse effects of climate change um, is here. Um, it's not something that will come in the future. It's already here, and especially um, in certain parts of the globe, like the Pacific. And um, it has an impact um, in particular uh, with regards to um, the uh, um, way it affects uh, people, um, peoples in those regions. So um, in the cover of Time magazine, not only it's called, um, you know, the title uh, is uh, our sinking planet, um, but it's highlighted uh, the impact on clean residents and disappearing villages because this is something that is 
already visible and and in and in, and it shows also the importance that this has um, in terms of the attention of the international uh, community. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about how uh, this topic, uh, sea level rise in relation to international law, came to the agenda of the International Law Commission, and and then as I said, I will focus on one of the subtopics, which is the one for which I'm responsible. Uh, on the protection of persons affected by sea level rise. I will uh, just very briefly touch on the scientific or factual basis, which is basically that, that we're using the work of the uh, Intergovernmental Plan Panel on Climate Change. And I will um, uh, uh, draw your attention to previous work that is relevant uh, for our purposes uh, that has been done by the International Law Commission on protection of persons in the event of disasters. Uh, but also not only in the ILC framework, uh, but in the International Law Association, uh, the, where there is a committee um, uh, also dealing with sea level rise um, and international law. And that committee has also worked um, on the aspects of protection of persons. And I'm also a member of that committee. Um, and I was fortunate to uh, see um, uh, the last phase where um, just before um, uh, the last um, annual biannual meeting of the ILA in Sydney in 2018, uh, an important resolution was passed uh, in this um, matter. And then I will explain a little bit uh, what are the plans uh, for uh, the future work of the Commission on this um, on this aspect. And so just to um, explain a little bit, um, you know, the, the different impacts that sea level rise has and that are of interest of, uh, to international law. One uh, thing that has to be highlighted is that the International Law Commission is not going to deal with the, all those potential um, impacts. So uh, issues that may arise in terms of peace and security and the Security Council has been uh, already highlighting the link between climate change, including sea level rise and peace and security, and issues of responsibility or liability for the causes of climate change and sea level rise. We're also not going to deal with it. Um, and also the more environmental protection aspects, uh, they are also outside of the scope of uh, the mandate of the Commission. So the mandate of the Commission and is um, um, limited to three subtopics, which is firstly the questions related to the law of the sea, and, and uh, the question that has to do with the possible loss of statehood, and then the questions related to displacement uh, of persons. So these are the topics that uh, when the Commission uh, has um, decided to um, include uh, initially uh, in the long-term program of work, um, I'm not sure how familiar, and also the participants, I'm sure there are some that are um, very familiar with the work of the Commission, but if there are some questions that have to do more with how we work in the ILC, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, but the process of putting a new topic in the agenda of the Commission and is a process that normally um, is taken on two phases or two steps. Initially, um, there is a um, proposal that is put in the long-term program of work, and only on a second stage it's moved to the um, active agenda of the Commission. And with regard to the sea level rise topic, um, there was um, a lot of, um, and I have to say, I I think this is one point that has to be highlighted. Um, and member states in the General Assembly um, have for a while had been calling for the Commission to look at uh, this uh, issue. So um, not only when um, you know the current Commission was, um, the candidates were campaigning, this was a regular issue that was um, uh, put forward by many topics in the discussions uh, that we had during the campaign, but also in statements before the General Assembly in uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, uh, called for the International Law Commission to look at the international law aspects related to sea level rise. And it's also interesting to note, and this is quite rare, 
and in the work of the Commission that uh, there was a formal proposal by a state, by the Federated States of Micronesia, uh, for the inclusion of this topic um, on the agenda uh, of the Commission. And it's against this background that um, uh, in 2018, the Commission decided formally in its 70th session uh, to include the topic of sea level rise in relation to international law in the long-term program of work. And immediately the year after, and also because of this level of support from the point of view of member states, immediately in the year after, so one year ago, uh, almost to the day, um, in May 2019, the Commission decided to move the topic to the active agenda and, and already had um, uh, initial meetings uh, regarding the topic in 2019. And I indicate in the slides the chapters of the report where you could uh, uh, find um, more information if you want to look for it. Um, one of the um, uh, special aspects about this, um, this topic and the way the Commission decided to deal with it is that it's not going to be dealt with through the normal process of appointment of a special rapporteur that will propose draft articles or draft conclusions or guidelines, but the Commission felt it was more appropriate to um, use the format that it's not so common, but it has been used in the past, um, of a study group. And this has to do with the nature of the topic and, and also the nature or the stage of practice and that perhaps is not as developed as in other areas of international law. So what we have is a study group, um, not the special rapporteur uh, um, uh, format. We have a study group uh, that is uh, led by um, uh, rotating co-chairs, and I'll explain that um, in a moment. Um, and um, we will look at uh, the three sub subtopics that I highlighted before law of the sea, statehoods, and protection of persons affected by sea level rise. These are the three subtopics that um, we chose because in a way they are um, um, touching the three elements of the state. So the territory, um, uh, population, and government. So they are uh, united in the sense that sea level rise has the potential to affect the three elements through these subtopics, the three elements of the state. And so we have um, a system of um, rotating co-chairs because it's quite a wide um, subject. If you consider um, uh, the three uh, sub-issues, law of the sea, statehood, and protection of persons, so we have um, the law of the sea topic, and we have two colleagues, uh, Bogdan Oresko and Ilifer Oral, who have the lead on that. So they are co-chairs for that subtopic. Uh, we have the topic of statehood, um, which is led by Juan Jose Ruda Santolaria. And then the question of protection of persons affected by sea level rise, where I am the responsible co-chair. So it's a little bit different than uh, the work, um, uh, the regular work of the Commission in terms of uh, uh, special rapporteurs, but so far it has um, uh, given uh, also an opportunity for the Commission to work a little bit differently and also to be able to work in a more collegial and interdisciplinary way. Um, so uh, we have here some dates indicated on, on when the reports are due, so this year um, uh, there is already a report, it's not out officially, but it will be out soon, and on the issues related to the law of the sea. And for next year, uh, we would address the questions of statehood and protection of persons. Of course, uh, this is all dependent on how uh, the situation regarding the um, current pandemic is going to evolve, because so far, and I actually, at this moment, I was supposed to be in for the ILC session, uh, we have not met in May, and we're still not sure whether we'll be able to meet in July when it's our normal sessions. And so we'll have to see how we can adjust the schedule if um, we're not able to meet um, uh, this year. So we are working um, not only um, as co-chairs in close contact, but also we are trying uh, to work as much as possible in contact with member states. We've held a number of side events in New York, 
uh, during the different stages of the process. We've had side events in Geneva. Uh, we've had already a regional workshop um, in Asia, in Singapore last November. Um, we hope to be able to host more side events, even if uh, at this moment they will have to be in a virtual form. And also we've had um, a number of um, uh, more informal consultations and uh, my, myself last summer I was able to talk to different um, uh, colleagues from uh, OIM, from UNHCR, from the Federation Red Cross Federation, and from the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights. And uh, I intend to continue those um, informal consultations to help uh, prepare um, uh, the, the, the reports. And uh, of course, I will explain at the end, there's also an opportunity for a formal input uh, from the point of view of uh, states and, um, and key states stakeholders, but I'll, I'll explain that at the very end. So the idea is that uh, for each subtopic, um, the co-chairs prepare an initial issues paper, which is going to be circulated officially um, as a UN document, like a special rapporteur report, um, translated in all the different languages. And that report, uh, that issues paper, is going to be debated um, in a study group that is open to all members of the International Law Commission, and they can contribute also um, with, with uh, papers of their own. And then uh, we will, after each discussion, we will include the report of that discussion in the annual report. The idea, um, as I said um, um, before, is um, to have um, a study as a final outcome, so it's not going to be um, a draft convention, it's not going to be conclusions or guidelines, but it's really a study um, in the form of a report where we would comp compile uh, the different um, uh, findings uh, from um, the discussions of the issues papers and the contributions of member states and international organizations. So this is likely to happen um, uh, not uh, this quinquennium, which is supposed to end next year, but um, and after uh, the next um, commission is elected and the elections are foreseen for um, November of uh, next year. Um, so just, just very briefly um, on the question um, of the scientific basis um, and, and, the factual, um, and the factual basis of sea level rise. I mean, we have been... Um, uh, saying, and we say that clearly in the syllabus uh, that, were, that we presented um, for approval of the topic, that we are not going to be discussing the science and the scientific basis. Uh, we'll be taking um, um, the question of sea level rise as a fact. Uh, and of course, for that purpose, we'll be uh, basing ourselves on the best available science and, of course, um, uh, one important source um, is the work of the um, IPCC. We had last uh, May uh, the opportunity of having one of the uh, scientists um, from the IPCC coming and talking to the Commission and explaining um, the physical science behind uh, sea level rise and how it's linked to climate change. And, and in the meantime, in September 2019, and um, we had uh, this new report on the ocean and the cryosphere. And we continue um, to we plan to continue to be engaging with the scientific community and um, for purposes of information um, of the commission, of the members of the commission, of our work. But of course, uh, we are not uh, um, discussing the scientific findings and the scientific basis. But what's important is that in this last report, and um, it's very clear um, that there is going to be um, an, an important impact um, of uh, sea level rise um, in uh, human communities uh, that live in more like uh, coastal zones. Um, and also, of course, um, with regard to the small island developing states. And this is important because uh, sometimes there's a tendency to link the question of sea level rise just with the small islands, the SIDS, the small islands in the Pacific or the Caribbean, but it's also true that there will be an, there will be an impact um, of um, 
sea level rise also in low-lying coastal zones. Um, and um, it's true that um, these areas are highly populated and they are um, uh, home to an impressive number of uh, persons that can be potentially affected. So this is not just an issue um, that has to do or that concerns uh, the small island developing states, but also um, other states that have a lying coasts. And of course, there will be the indirect impacts for other states, neighboring states. And that's also why we say that this is you know, a global uh, issue that needs uh, global solutions. And so we, we've had in this um, uh, IPCC report from uh, September 2019, also a confirmation that uh, sea level rise is increasing at an accelerated pace. Of course, this is not an even phenomenon. It will affect some areas more than other areas. It uh, has identified um, um, special areas that are at risk. Uh, like some mega cities that you can see in the screen, but also, of course, the small island states. And um, this uh, uh, report also confirms that there is, uh, even under um, uh, um, a, low, a low emission scenario, um, there is uh, risk. Um, it may be lower, but there's still um, uh, risk. And so um, there are different app impacts in terms of uh, erosion, land loss, flooding, salinization, uh, that makes um, uh, more difficult the water access, the food security, uh, the health conditions, and also livelihoods in those areas. And it's true that, um, you know, as many in many other phenomena that have to do uh, with uh, climate change, but now also we see with the COVID-19 pandemics, it's normally and the persons that are more vulnerable that are um, at the front and of uh, suffering with this type of uh, phenomenon. Just uh, quickly, um, the report, of course, being a scientific uh, report and not something that deals with uh, legal issues, and um, it's still uh, considered that there are at least two types of immediate responses. And um, the first one is a physical response, which is a protection of the coast, uh, that the fortification of the coast, protection of the coast, and the other one when the first one is not possible and uh, the question of um, uh, uh, physical protection is not possible, the relocation and uh, the relocation um, as an, uh, an efficient measure, but of course a last resort measure. And so, of course, uh, the report, as I said, it's not uh, dealing with the legal issues. It presents some practical solutions. So there is a lot of issues to be addressed in terms of legal frameworks and the different forms of human mobility that this phenomenon may induce and what kinds of um, institutional frameworks could exist for um, cooperation. So this is where then the legal analysis starts uh, coming in. And from the point of view of the work we'll be doing in the commission, there are at least um, uh, two um, uh, immediate uh, um, documents that are um, important in uh, helping us uh, with framing uh, the issues. The first one, as I said before, it's work done by the Commission uh, that deals with the um, protection of persons uh, in the event of disasters. This was work that was concluded in 2016, and um, uh, it's now before the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly and as a proposal for a new convention. Um, of course, sea level rise is presented as a disaster, so it could be uh, also used as a framework. Um, but the framework uh, of uh, these draft articles have to do with a more um, immediate uh, response to disaster solving and not to more long-term um, uh, solutions that uh, sea level rise will have to um, require. So. And I've put on the screen um, uh, the um, main articles um, on, of this project so that you have an idea. And of course, human rights appear, um, human dignity and human rights appear at a very um, uh, highlighted at the beginning. But you also have questions um, in terms of the duty to cooperate, to cooperate and the need to um, also uh, respect the role of the affected states. And, and the consent of the affected states. So these principles will be, of course, certainly important also in the way we think of uh, 
eventually framing principles for the protection of persons affected by um, sea level rise. And the other very important um, work that has been done um, and it has been carried out um, in the framework of the International Law Association um, in a committee that deals with sea level rise and international law. Um, and this um, committee has produced um, a set of uh, principles um, related to the protection of persons displaced in the context of sea level rise. Um, and it's also, um, although um, I can explain then afterwards in the uh, Q&A session uh, how the work of the ILA is a bit different from the Commission in the sense that in the ILC there is much more close contact with states and I'm taking a, um, into account also the views of states. But this um, set of um, the Sydney principles, they offer uh, very important guidance um, in terms of uh, how to uh, frame uh, legally the uh, protection of persons um, displaced in the context of sea level rise. Again, starting from a primary duty and responsibility of the states affected to protect their own population and the important call of respecting the human rights of the affected persons, the duty to take positive action, duty to cooperate, and then the different situations where you have um, immediate um, uh, operations of, evacu of evacuation, questions of plan relocation, and then the more complex issues of the migration and uh, schemes that uh, could be put in place um, for internal displacement and cross border displacement. And so these are um, very important background uh, documents to the work to be developed by the International Law Commission and they will certainly be taken um, into account because they've been important work then, um, especially in the case of this last uh, ILA document by uh, uh, experts, uh, expert experts on the field. And so what we've put on the syllabus, so this is really the mandate that we have for the questions related to the protection of persons, and they are framed in uh, five um, uh, issues that have to do with uh, many of the questions uh, that we were discussing before. So the question of the duty of states to protect the rights of the individuals, the principle of international cooperation and how it can uh, help uh, states to cope with this um, adverse effect of sea level rise on the population, and what principles could be applicable uh, for states to help their population to remain in situ. And this is a quite an um, important aspect because if you ask um, most uh, people that are affected by uh, this issue, um, their preference is certainly to stay uh, where, they, uh, where they were born, where they grown, where they have their families, their cultural um, and their cultural ties. And their livelihood. So this aspect is um, particularly important. And so then uh, we can look at principles that have to do with evacuation, relocation, and migration abroad. And of course, the whole framework of uh, human rights um, uh, of persons that are on the move, uh, that are affected by the different forms of mobility. So this is um, the, the issues that we're going to try to look at. Of course, in, in the first uh, report, um, as I said, that uh, I hope to um, be able to present early next year. Um, we will be looking, it's of, of course um, a preliminary report, it's the first part of a um, uh, study. And that you are welcome, so uh, please uh, continue your presentation. Could you tell me where I was, where there was interruption? Because I, I wasn't was able uh, I mean, uh, 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 the slide you, you have here about the international legal framework for analysis. Okay, just before, the one just before. Here? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I just repeat very briefly because I, I wasn't sure where um, the transmission was stopped. Um, I don't know if there are some networks, network problems on my side. I apologize. So I was um, 
I was explaining that um, you no, know, we will uh, in this first uh, issues paper in this first report that will be of a preliminary nature. We will look at the different uh, legal frameworks um, applicable. So we will try to map. Um, uh, the area, the international legal um, uh, principles that are or could be applicable to this type of situations. Of course, from these different areas of international law, some will be more relevant than others, but we will go through them and try to find uh, what um, is already there that could be um, useful to try to frame um, the legal regime for the protection of persons affected by uh, sea level rise. And then, of course, the other very important task um, of this first report that will be, of course, an ongoing task uh, because this is an area where practice is developing. Um, we will try to identify the relevant state practice and also from um, international and regional organizations and bodies. So I was saying that uh, there are already a lot of things happening um, in the ground in terms of um, states responding to the phenomena. So we've seen that um, you know, in some um, countries like Indonesia or Fiji, there are villages that are being relocated. Um, in uh, uh, Kiribati, for example, is buying land in Fiji to relocate its, um, its nationals. Uh, there have been examples of migrations to other countries discussions of um, establishing humanitarian visa programs. So there is a lot of happening in the ground also at the state level, and we'll look at that. Um, but there's also an important practice from international organizations and other relevant stakeholders. And as I said, I've had initial informal contacts with the uh, IOM, the, I uh, the International Federation of the Red Cross, the ICRC also, UNHCR, the Office of the High Commissioner, the Platform for Disaster, displacement, and, and I also intend to have contacts with World Bank, the OECD, and the United Nations, the Secretariat for the Convention on the Framework on Climate Change, and to uh, go also and see what is happening from the point of view um, of um, those um, relevant stakeholders uh, of uh, what's happening in the ground and what measures are being taken. Um, uh, to cope, uh, to help states to cope with um, uh, the phenomenon of skill level rise. Of course, there are also um, important developments that are emerging, and, um, and in Geneva, again, uh, is really the place uh, for those developments or most of those developments when we are talking about the treaty monitoring bodies. There have been important cases that have been filed uh, petitions, communications presented uh, before the Human Rights Committee and, and also before the Commission, uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child. So this is something that certainly we're going to be paying a lot of uh, attention uh, to. Um, of course, there is this um, view, view that came out recently in January um, concerning the case of um, a citizen of Kiribati who was in New Zealand. Um, and, um, and, and the, uh, the Human Rights Committee uh, decided that at this moment there wasn't, with the return of that citizen back to uh, Kiribati, there wasn't a violation of his right to life. But uh, eventually in the future, uh, with the consequences of climate change and sea level rise, that could be a reality. And we have also ongoing cases um, also before the Human Rights Committee regarding um, Australian citizens in the Torres Strait and this very um, important um, new communication presented by a group of uh, 16 children, including uh, children from Palau and the Marshall Islands. And so there's a dimension uh, regarding sea level rise also in this famous case where Greta Thunberg is also involved. So, Harvesting state practice and practice of international organizations and treaty bodies will be a, an important task. And, and as I said, uh, we will do that from the side of the commission and the study group. But of course, there's also a formal opportunity for states and, and international organizations and, um, and institutions like the International Red Cross and Red Cross Movement to provide information, this is a, a quote from uh, the report from last year, asking formally 
states and international organizations to contribute uh, with their practice. And there was a paragraph in the middle uh, regarding the part on the law of the sea uh, where the request was for this year. But of course, regarding protection of persons affected by sea level rise, uh, we are hoping to get also um, more formally uh, this information from um, uh, the relevant stakeholders. So I think I would stop here. Um, I'm sorry for the interruption and if, and if I got lost somewhere in the middle, uh, but I hope uh, with the slides uh, you were able to follow and I look forward to this um, to the discussion and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very clear uh, and informative presentation. Uh, obviously, uh, this is uh, a crucial, not only a crucial issue, but also a work in progress for the International Law Commission. Uh, uh, before uh, opening the floor to question and answer, uh, and please, for all uh, participants, please uh, feel free to uh, uh, raise your question and comments in the specific box dedicated to question and answer, and then I will be able to raise uh, them to uh, the speaker and uh, discuss uh, the questions uh, further. Maybe uh, to start and to give also more time for participants uh, to, uh, to, to raise questions, um, the, 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 the nominative framework is uh, rich and complex. Uh, and as you rightly mentioned, it is based on uh, uh, many different uh, applicable rules, areas, uh, based on human rights law, environmental law, uh, and many others. In terms of protection and according to the data uh, and the practice, in fact, uh, what's uh, the, the effect of climate change in general, but also uh, of the, the uh, sea level rise on uh, displacement uh, is used to follow a three steps process. Uh, uh, generally uh, speaking, so the, uh, in the short term, uh, uh, affected persons uh, uh, are used to become internally displaced persons. Then, uh, at uh, midterm, uh, they can uh, become forced migrants, and finally, at a very long term, stateless person if an island suddenly disappears, uh, uh, not suddenly because uh, uh, disappear in, in the sea. Uh, all these uh, effects are used to follow uh, a quite clear chronological order uh, according to, to the latest uh, data. Uh, and what is interesting for international lawyers is also, and, and, and it is, uh, I'm coming to my question, uh, uh, each categories, IDPs, forced migrants, stateless persons, are governed both by general human rights uh, uh, rules, to, to sum up, and more specialized instruments dedicated to IDPs in a soft law way uh, at the universal level through the UN uh, uh, displacement, uh, stateless persons through the relevant uh, stateless convention and so on. So uh, I would like to have your view because given that there is these three, uh, uh, three step processes and uh, given the broad variety of uh, general and specific rules. Uh, I would like to raise a question that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, occupies my mind since a while and also my publication, because I have the impression that is confirmed, first of all, that the general framework is uh, 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 applicable to the three steps and provided a common ground of, uh, uh, of uh, legally binding rule is offered, first of all, by human rights law as such, uh, because of its comprehensive nature, it is able to address IDPs, forced migrants, stateless persons, and also because uh, the specialized instruments uh, are, uh, are, are not always binding. When they are binding, they are not ratified by a, a significant number of persons. So I'm thinking about stateless persons. 
And when they are well ratified, such as the Refugee Convention, they are not bound to be very relevant uh, uh, simply because uh, 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 the, the refugee definition is not, uh, is not well adapted to uh, the new reality of climate change. Uh, I'm used to say that uh, climate uh, I mean, the key notion of the refugee definition is persecution. Climate change does not persecute. Climate change uh, persecution requires uh, uh, an action or an omission of a state or non-state actors. So some kinds of intention, climate change being an objective phenomenon, clearly as a refugee convention uh, has a very limited impact. So uh, against this framework, uh, 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 I would like to have your view about uh, uh, the, uh, the centrality of German rights, first of all, and the way it can articulate with more specific uh, instruments. And then I will come back to uh, to, the, uh, to the participant uh, with a very interesting question. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Chetal. Thank you for um, this very interesting uh, comment and, and questions. And I think that um, you've touched on um, extremely important issues, and I think that's why it is very important in this first report um, to start by looking at the applicable legal frameworks. I think this is um, um, uh, very important um, to be as comprehensive as possible, to identify what are the instruments that um, exist already. And of course, in that um, uh, notion, I include both uh, treaties, uh, but also, of course, soft law instruments. And there are several areas where we found we find, as you mentioned, uh, those soft law instruments. So I think it is very important that we have a very thorough um, view of the different applicable uh, legal frameworks uh, to try to see um, um, what is relevant and how is it relevant for this specific issue. Um, of course, I mean, it could be relevant also uh, for other impacts of climate change. Um, but in this project, we are focusing, uh, sometimes we've had discussions on how do you um, identify that uh, certain movement, certain displacement has been caused by sea level rise. That's one of the issues that sometimes is difficult in practice, because many times it may be, you know, uh, migration to another country or even the displacement internally may be uh, happening by a number of reasons and sometimes only indirectly by sea level rise. So that's also that adds a difficulty, a complexity to the issue. But the, um, uh, the first step has to be, and I think you've, um, you've uh, said it in a very eloquent way, um, to look at the different um, um, uh, legal uh, frameworks that are applicable, um, having in mind that uh, human rights constitute this general background, general legal framework applicable, and of course, for that reason, it's on the top of the list. So we, we, we'll, we're going to have um, to look um, and first, of course, to um, the uh, human rights that could be mostly um, affected um, or whose, uh, which enjoyment could be mostly affected by sea level rise. And of course, um, if we look, uh, including at this uh, um, uh, recent petitions before the um, human rights treaty bodies, you have the right to life and you have the right to health. Um, you have cultural rights, you have the right to water, so it will be a right also to freedom of, of movement, movement, right to return, and the principle of non reforma which is also important, and in this case, um, in, uh, that was already decided by the Human Rights Committee, and in, in fact, what the Human Rights Committee said was that uh, um, even if we're not dealing with the refugee situation and the, 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 the person would not come under the um, uh, definition of the refugee convention, um, the human rights um, notion of non refoulement is uh, wider. And if there was a case where the right to life when the person was to be returned to his original country was uh, at risk, 
which the committee said at this moment that was not the case. There was not a direct harm uh, that would put the right to life at risk. But in the future, if the situation is worsened and if the state doesn't take enough measures, so there's still time for the state to take measures. So this part about adaptation and, and international cooperation, it's also quite important. But of course, we have um, a general human rights framework um, that is applicable. And then, of course, we have to look at the different forms of mobility, um, uh, which I don't think it's a legal concept yet, but uh, it's a useful concept to describe the different situations of IDPs, of uh, migration. And um, um, uh, then we would have to look then at the more specific regimes. But I, I very much agree, and I think it's a very helpful way to look at it, and, and it's what is also formatting um, this idea of uh, looking at the different frameworks with human rights on, on top, uh, to look at the different, um, different aspects and, and to try to see as much in existing law uh, what uh, principles and rules could be used uh, for this specific purpose. Um, just one small point on the question of statelessness. Um, it's something that um, we will have to see how uh, we deal with it um, because it will um, only happen if the state disappears. Um, uh, and so in some cases uh, where we will have a line, um, coastal states that will have a significant part of their territory inundated, for example, you know, thinking about Bangladesh or Vietnam or um, Indonesia. I mean, the issue of statelessness will not appear. Um, so it will only appear um, in the case where there's the risk more down the road. As you said, also, you know, it's a more long term and also limited to those um, worst case scenarios um, where the, uh, there's a risk of the state disappearing. But of course, I'm not minimizing that because there is a real list risk with regard to certain um, states that are currently members of the UN and then there's a real risk that they may disappear. And this is something that has never happened before. Uh, we've had you know, the creation of states, we had state succession, but we never had physical disappearance of the states. So this is an important uh, aspect, um, but completely new that will have to be dealt with. And of course, um, if the state disappears and there's no legal solution for that, you may have stateless persons. But maybe um, if there is some continuity of the legal personality because the state becomes a part of um, a federated entity, uh, like sometimes it has been suggested, then maybe you wouldn't have uh, statelessness. So I think that part um, is probably the the part in my area, in my report, that is closely linked to also to the statehood part. And uh, it's also a reason why we are dealing, of course, statehood also has connections with the law of the sea part. I mean, this is all a bit interconnected, but we'll also have to look into that aspect. But I think the way you've put it, I fully agree. And it's very important to look um, at the more general framework of human rights and the more specialized, and also look at the different um, time frames because this um, consequences and the different status will happen uh, in different time frames. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, and also, also uh, it was very clear. And, and of course, there is a need uh, to Questions: The need for a more systemic approach to cable rules because they run to, to the phenomena. Uh, we have the chance uh, among our participants, and I'm just uh, discovering that we have the chance to have uh, Walter Kellin, a uh, worldwide uh, expert on uh, these issues since a while. And I would like, uh, uh, I guess you have, uh, you are able to, to uh, I would like that you address is a uh, question. Uh, uh, it is mentioned in the box uh, uh, you, you have uh, on the question and answer. And uh, uh, about, uh, I mean, and a, a very interesting point uh, because clearly uh, uh, about the duty to protect and the limit of states, uh, let's say, of origin and, and so on. So, uh, 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 could you please address this question, and then uh, we will continue with the other ones. 
Yes. Um, I, for some reason, I'm not uh, seeing the question in the chat. Um, Let me. I. I that's empty. But if, you. But if I understand it, uh, it has to do with the duty um, of the affected state and responsibilities of the affected state. I, I don't. I don't see it anywhere. So uh, I, I will uh, read uh, uh, this question. Any preliminary thought on the duty to protect understood as a duty of the state on whose territory people affected by sea level rise live? So how to deal with the challenge that uh, uh, the uh, SIDS often uh, are not in position to protect as they are victims themselves? And yep. here, probably the duty also beyond duty to protect, the duty of cooperation is probably bound to play a key role here, uh, no. as mentioned in your slides. No. no I, uh, first of all, let me say hello to Professor Kaelin and then greet him uh, in this virtual means. We were supposed to have um, a meeting in Geneva in March. <laughs> that didn't happen, but we've been in contact um, in the framework of the ILA committee uh, where uh, Professor Kalin and also Professor Jane McAdam play the key role um, in developing those, um, those Sydney principles that I mentioned. Um, and um, I'm a, a big um, admirer of his work and um, I look forward to continue our um, discussions and having your input also for the work of the, of the International Law Commission. Um, the question, I think, it's, uh, I think it has to be, in a way, the, start, the starting point. I think uh, just like the um, uh, draft articles on uh, disasters, uh, protection of persons in the event of disasters, and also the Sydney principles, I think that um, one has to, before moving into the next steps, of course, one has to recognize um, that uh, the principal duty and in first instance uh, to protect the persons affected by sea level rise and is um, of the of the state where the phenomenon is taking place so i think that's clear and that's something that certainly um, uh, in our uh, work will be a guiding principle and i'm sure that um, you know in the contact with the member states this will also be highlighted um, as i was mentioning uh, before, uh, one of the differences between the work of the ILC and the ILA or the Institut de Droit International, for that matter, is that uh, you know, everything we do um, is commented on an annual basis by member states, and also we have these direct, direct requests uh, for member states. So the input uh, from states um, uh, state views as to the and state of the law, their own practice, and what we propose as ideas and solutions is quite important. And I think from that perspective, and linked also, of course, to the question of uh, sovereignty and consent, that's a very important starting point. Um, but of course, um, the issue, and, and, um, and of course, this is a especially special concern, and um, maybe not so much from the point of view of low-lying coastal states, as I was mentioning, like uh, in, in uh, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Vietnam, et cetera, or the U.S., for that matter, because you also have a lot of cities that get in the United States and other parts of the world. But for small island developing states, um, the issue of whether they're able um, uh, to protect their own population is, is a key issue. So I think that... Um, um, not entering because we said we would not enter into that discussion. Although, uh, for example, in the proposal that Micronesia put forward and in some discussions that we've heard in the General Assembly and also in formal contacts, um, SIDS would like the Commission also to deal with the question from the point of view of uh, liability and the possibility of financing, but uh, we didn't feel that we were in a position to enter into that discussion. And so the question will not be dealt in that way, but I think as you also mentioned, and the question mentions the, the relevance of uh, um, international cooperation. And, and, and um, 
Uh, I have um, some ideas, but I think it will be also very important to see um, how we can densify, how we can frame this um, general obligation of uh, cooperation um, from other states and other entities. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite um, interesting and many people have been making the link between what's happening um, in the current uh, pandemic situation and climate change and the question of the relevance of cooperation, but how, how do you put it into place and what type of legal content also um, it has. But I think it's, it's an area that I'm very keen to explore um, uh, legally, um, you know, how uh, can we frame uh, legally the principle of international cooperation that, of course, is in the charter of the UN and in um, uh, the international covenants and in many other instruments, but it's framed in a very general matter. And so I think we will have to see how we can frame that part. Uh, but it's, it's key. I mean, not only um, in the region, I think that the, the question of regional cooperation is going to be uh, very important. And for example, um, you know, actions that uh, New Zealand and Australia are taking in, in this area, they are extremely um, impo important and they are probably going to be one of the pillars uh, um, uh, of solutions to be found to deal with these questions, but more broadly an international legal um, a cooperation uh, system uh, will be also quite relevant. It's, uh, it's, I think it's one of those um, you know, tricky areas where you have uh, an important principle that, that it's framed in very general terms and then you, uh, we're going to have to do to see how we can uh, densify it and put it in more concrete terms. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another question from uh, uh, Carlos Cruz. Uh, do you think that an advisory opinion from the ICG, uh, uh, the International Court of Justice, or the International Tribunal uh, on the Law of the Sea would be helpful for uh, your work on ICC? Uh, their opinion on sea level and so on? No. No, thank you very much for that question. I mean, of course, uh, an advisory opinion would be uh, very helpful. I mean, depending on the content, but uh, that would give us um, a more solid uh, background also to um, identify uh, the principles applicable. I, I suppose the question is asked because there is some movement um, towards that. I mean, the, the question of an advisory opinion before the ICJ, um, as far as I know, more broadly related to climate change and the question of liability, responsibility for climate change has been uh, discussed by some Pacific states. There have been some ideas, some papers. Um, of course, the problem uh, would be that you would need the um, uh, General Assembly or another specialized agency to request. Um, such opinion. Um, more recently, there are some uh, discussions about the possibility of uh, an, an advisory opinion of ITLOS, which seems also to be an interesting idea. Of course, it would be more limited uh, to the areas that are covered by UNCLOS. Um, so far, uh, those ideas have not yet materialized, but of course, um, anything that would help us um, identify um, the relevant legal principles and, of course, as everybody knows, the International Law Commission um, not only um, looks very seriously at um, um, all that is, uh, of course, treaty law, customary international law, um, but although um, case law of the ICJ and advisory opinions, they are a secondary source, but of course they are a very authoritative um, uh, source and, and the work of the Commission is very much influenced uh, by decisions and advisory opinions of international courts and tribunals. So, um, you know, if you ask me politically, um, can, will that be feasible or will that happen in the near future? I, I really don't know. I think it really depends and I know there are efforts going on. Um, if it happens from the point of view of the Commission, of course, uh, it will be another tool that will add to our 
um, toolbox um, of um, instruments to and 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 uh, documents to analyze. And uh, and if I, I can, add, uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, scholars and international lawyers are also, I must say, frankly, uh, uh, they are used to overestimate the role of uh, the advisory opinion of justice, but. I mean, uh, it's, uh, such an advisory opinion he, uh, from the International Court of Justice he, uh, can also have uh, some uh, uh, counterproductive uh, effect huh, on the development of international law and so on, in the sense that the court is not necessarily the most relevant and the most progressive arena to discuss new topics or emerging trends. Huh? Totally clear, and uh, of course, uh, this is also our work uh, as international lawyers to uh, do uh, 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 a proper job in identifying uh, rules uh, and the applicable principles. In the sense that uh, this is always good to have an advisory opinion, but we can also, uh, as uh, scholars, give a contribution in identifying. Find the applicable uh, uh, framework. I will uh, jump with uh, the next question, uh, quite interesting also, uh, uh, about uh, accountability and responsibility. Uh, and is the scope of the ILC will cover this question of accountability and responsibility, and in particular, uh, in, uh, when uh, states fail to comply with their international oblig uh, obligations on climate change. So, uh, another uh, important and intriguing question. Yes. Now, I think I was clear from my presentation, and if you read the syllabus um, that was approved, so it's, uh, in a way, our mandate, um, the questions of uh, responsibility and accountability are um, excluded, at least for now, uh, from um, uh, the work that we'll be carrying out. Um, and, and I think there are um, uh, two main reasons. Um, one um, reason is mostly uh, political, um, and, uh, and I can be uh, clear about that. Of course, I'm speaking uh, as a co-chair of, uh, of um, the study group and responsible for my part, but uh, um, and this is something that we um, had, um, you know, that we discussed um, among the um, initiators of the group and in the commission. And um, because there was such a sense of um, urgency and importance um, from the point of view of member states to put this rapidly on the agenda, um, we decided to focus um, on the topics that, um, on the one hand, were, uh, as I explained, um, directly relevant and they were linked um, with each other, directly relevant on, you know, this unique impact. And, and I can say maybe that, you know, from the point of view of the state, um, sea level rise is the only adverse impact of climate change that has this impact on the state. So if you think of, uh, you know, global warming in general or drought or um, um, uh, forest fires, um, they don't have the potential to affect the state in such a broad way uh, that it affects its territory, including the maritime territory. It affects uh, the possibility of the disappearance of the state and, and, and the population in such a definitive way, especially if the state is at risk of disappearing. And so we wanted to limit ourselves to this, you know, st strong impacts on the state itself um, of uh, sea level rise in this uh, unique sense um, and, and um, leave um, outside um, issues that I said, uh, you know, for also for political reasons would be um, more um, complicated to address. Um, and our assessment was that if we were to include, um, as um, some states 
namely SIDS wanted us to include, if we were to include um, uh, the question of accountability and responsibility for climate change, and in particular for sea level rise, in the topic um, that, that could risk the project, that could endanger the project, because it's such a, uh, politically it's such a difficult question. Then I think I also have to say that, um, you know, legally it's a fascinating question. Um, but at the same time, it's a very difficult one to uh, respond. I mean, if you look at the articles uh, that the Commission has done on, on state responsibility, you know, the question of attribution um, uh, in this type of uh, phenomena, it would be extremely complex to determine. Um, it would be extremely complex to determine historically um, over time. Uh, it would be extremely complex to determine um, uh, the link between um, certain actions and the effects uh, that it has um, in certain territories. And also, you would have also to address um, the question of uh, the actions of private actors, because um, many of these issues are um, acts that are the emissions are then by um, uh, private companies and not by the state itself. So it's uh, you know legally um, it's uh, it's a very um, uh, complex question, extremely um, interesting, but very very complex, and 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 we didn't feel, find ourselves in the position to uh, both because of the political implications and the legal difficulties. Uh, to address and and the outline is quite clear to um, that we exclude this from our um, uh, our mandate at this moment. Thank you very much. But it is obviously uh, part of the picture and probably the most sensitive issue. It has been also raised by one of our students at the Graduate Institute. Uh, uh, if you can see, there's a question from Alexandra Anskaya uh, uh, mentioning in link to. Is it more morally justified to all biggest industries accountable for climate change uh, related human displacement? And can we talk uh, uh, here about responsibility and burden sharing among states based on their contribution to global warming? And there are the, uh, beyond, uh, the, the legal issues at stake, there are the key issues. Uh, issues in terms of uh, global justice and uh, accountability in a non-legal uh, way, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, it is uh, clearly the issue. And this could pave the way for also uh, a minimum of uh, at least accountability, uh, 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 if not accountability, at least cooperation, in the sense mm -hmm. that I mean, uh, 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 we know uh, uh, the, the causes of this phenomenon. In most cases, and it was also mentioned by, uh, also indirectly by uh, Walter Kelly, I mean, the affected states are generally the victims of a broader phenomenon that is created by others. So at some point, even if, mm -hmm. of course, this is politically sensitive, but at some point, there is a need to address uh, this issue uh, in uh, uh, a political fora. Uh, well, another. Uh, I would like to jump on uh, uh, another question, uh, and of course, feel free to answer also to, to the point uh, just raised before about the broader uh, responsibility of the industry and, and clearly Western states uh, also in this phenomenon of uh, global warming. But uh, 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 on the more specific issue, there was also a, a, a question that, uh, in fact, I was also uh, uh, to, 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 uh, right. um, it, uh, what would be the impact of the two global compacts on the work, on your work uh, in the work of the ILC, uh, the Refugee Compact and Migration Compact adopted by the General Assembly in December 2018, and uh, and here uh, clearly uh, 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 Refugee Compact is quite poor uh, uh, regarding. Uh, these kind of issues. I mean, it's, uh, it addresses only in a very indirect and in passing. Uh, whereas the Global Compact for Migration contains a, a dedicated section on the Objective 2 that could also be used as a, a framework uh, for actions because, after all, uh, in contrast with, with many other uh, previous software instruments, states 
are uh, committed to uh, uh, take actions on, uh, uh, on the objectives. So what is your view about the role of the two uh, compacts uh, of, in order to inform your own work and also to help raise uh, uh, this issue uh, uh, at the international uh, level, uh, in addition, of course, with the Manson Initiative and so on? Yeah. No, thank you very much. Um, uh, just very shortly, because I think I answered the, the previous question I had already answered. Um, but just the question, I mean, it's um, from our point of view at the moment, this was a clear and deliberate choice. It's not that the question doesn't exist and that it's not important. Um, and, and it's one of the dimensions also like peace and security or the environmental decision, the dimension um, that are also other important dimensions of um, sea level rise that we are uh, on a deliberate choice for political and legal reasons, um, uh, we are not addressing and we were quite clear. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, there are other forums maybe to address them or that uh, later on in time, um, the idea now for us is to do an initial um, uh, mapping of the question on these uh, three subtopics and, and, and then we don't know what's going to happen. So it's possible that um, we get the sense that uh, we should uh, continue to work in all the three topics that we could add more um, or that we could just pursue uh, and go more into the traditional work of uh, codification and progressive development regard to one of the subtopics. So we don't know. We'll see a little bit. So this is an, and that's why also we're doing it in the format of a study group. Uh, what we really felt was an urgency to have an objective um, a study, a, a mapping of the legal issues. We decided to focus on, focus on these three that are linked to the elements of the states. And but we will see what happens afterwards. But certainly, you know, the question of. Uh, um, you know, the, the, also the, 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 the real issue of, um, of funding uh, for the most vulnerable countries that are most affected and that least contributed uh, to the phenomena is, is, is a, a, a key question. And also on the question that uh, we discussed on cooperation, um, I think there are also other avenues that are being um, developed in terms uh, not so much in um, in having a direct link between uh, the polluters and, and the funders, but uh, more in the uh, in in the framework of uh, building a, a financial funds um, for um, states that would need um, financial assistance um, uh, to be able to uh, draw from that uh, financial fund. I think that's also a mutualized financial funding. And I think that's also a very promising and interesting idea. And, and of course, um, you know, if you think of countries like the Netherlands, uh, who've been experience, uh, experiencing this issue, um, and they have had, you know, the finances and the technology to build fortification of their coast, which is something that, for instance, Tuvalu or Vanuatu uh, maybe wouldn't have unless there's some kind of uh, international funding available. But I think uh, you know ideas that are in the climate change regime that are being exploited in terms of um, you know bu building a, um, a, a, a fund um, for um, this um, uh, these purposes are probably uh, even more um, efficient, uh, if I can say so, than than trying to find a link between a causation link um, that has, uh, as I mentioned, the legal and the difficult um, uh, difficulties um, uh, that we just discussed. So um, on the question of the role of the compacts, yes, of course, indeed, it will be um, also those soft law instruments that we will be looking at. Um, uh, we've, uh, I, I personally, I started looking already when the New York declarations um, in 2018 were out, um, 17, and then and then now the compacts. Um, the Global Compact for Migration has uh, specific references to sea level rise, so certainly that will be also you know, a background. So we'll try to, when I describe the legal frameworks, um, uh, it's not, we're not just going to look at the hard law, but certainly we'll be looking at all the soft law instruments and, and the practice that states will be developing on the basis of uh, those uh, commitments they've taken and the, the, 
especially the, the compact for migration. Yes, and, and, and if I may, because given the relatively open-ended worded the wording of uh, the compact on seas, and because states are supposed to uh, implement uh, the actions uh, uh, in the compact, despite its non-binding form, I think it, it, there is probably an opportunity for, uh, for the International Law Commission also not only to use the compact uh, as a source to inform, uh, as a soft instrument to inform the work, but also an opportunity for the International Law Commission to propose uh, the way to go forward in order to uh, 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 implement the actions uh, listed under uh, Objective 2. Uh, because mm. after all, the International Law Commission is not, uh, uh, not only a chamber to endorse what is done by state, but also the key uh, uh, role, uh, and you can say so, the social role within the International Society of the Commission is also to ensure uh, uh, progressive development of international law. And here mm -hmm. there is probably a room for the International Commission uh, to provide some guidance for states in order to uh, develop and implement further the relatively general, uh, to be fair, uh, actions uh, related to uh, natural disasters, uh, mm -hmm. The migration compact. Uh, there is uh, uh, another uh, 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 question, and I think that this is uh, uh, also an important one uh, uh, about your thought on the implication of the Human Rights Committee view uh, in the Teyota uh, te, uh, te, 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 case and, and the, 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 the potential for the principle of non refinement under human rights law to address the legal gap of protection in this area uh, raised by uh, Carola uh, Saleta. So, uh, and clearly here, uh, it would be very interesting to have uh, your view about, uh, about, his, uh, uh, about the potential of this case in particular, and more generally the principle of non refinement under human rights law. Yes, no, I think this um, this case has been um, um, extremely important in the sense that it's been the first decision um, of this type, um, and it's something that um, directly relates to sea level rise because uh, we've seen a lot of work, um, uh, especially in the framework of the Human Rights Council and the special rapporteurs on human rights um, and the environment and climate change, and, and, and normally and the question of sea level rise doesn't appear um, so much focused. And one of our concerns, as, as I was saying, is um, also because we've had those discussions um, within the Commission, and, and, and I think it's also um, a fair concern, that we try to um, identify in the first place um, the developments that are relevant and um, specifically with regard to the sea level context and not just draw, of course, we will have to do that and we will do it certainly in a more broad terms, um, you know, in other ways on how um, uh, climate change impacts enjoyment of human rights. But here we have a specific case that deals with sea level, level rise and that there was a clear link made between um, and the initial uh, move um, of uh, the, 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 the uh, citizen from Kiribati when he went to New Zealand and all the process in the New Zealand um, uh, courts and tribunals and then uh, the um, petition that was submitted um, to the Human Rights Committee. So the, really the question was the question of, uh, of sea level rise and, uh, and, and the risk to the right, right to life when going back uh, to the country. Um, so um, with that background, and, and of course agreeing with uh, what you've said before, and we, we certainly have that same view also that uh, you know, the, um, yeah, the Convention on, uh, on Refugees is not applicable um, as such. And, and I think that uh, you know, I, I have that question many times when I talk about this issue, you know, students ask, but why don't we change uh, the refugee convention definition? Uh, and that's, that's you know, it's it's a fair discussion, 
Um, I don't think that um, it's the moment to do it, and it's probably not the role of the ILC to propose that. Um, so it will be very important to explore um, within the existing international law and uh, taking into account that the uh, climate refugees is not a legal uh, category as such, um, what other instruments could be there um, that would avoid the situation of somebody um, being returned to his country where there was really a, a risk um, of um, his human rights being violated, including the uh, um, uh, right to life. And, and so the application that um, the Human Rights Committee makes of the non conformal principle in this case, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting um, approach um, that could be um, a useful one. And of course, um, it, it, uh, it all depends on the concrete circumstances. And the Human Rights Committee uh, I discussed that, not only in terms of the analysis that was done by the New Zealand courts, but also on the uh, available information. So this is something that has to be taken um, uh, in our view on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the circumstances, and it's not something that can be applied across the board without having due regard to the circumstances in this particular case. The Human Rights Committee decided that uh, the situation as of now, as of now in Kiribati, and, and the, the fact that New Zealand returned the person to Kiribati was not a violation of the right to of non lawful one. But if, if the situation gets worse in the future, and if there is um, lack of conditions for uh, and, and there, the Human Rights Committee has had uh, quite a broad um, uh, understanding of what's the right uh, to life and what can in impair that um, an enjoyment of the right to life. Um, if, if in the future the situation gets worse um, on the ground, then, then I think we could see um, uh, the, the, the Human Rights Committee applying the non reform principle. So I think it's a, something that we have to take into account, um, and, and, it, and it's an interesting uh, way also to um, address that gap that we have um, in terms of uh, non-existence of a legal category of uh, climate refugees. Thank you very much. And of course, I mean, the gap, there is a gap from the angle of the Geneva Convention, but it is a state from the angle of other instruments, we can argue that they are apt to be uh, applied, uh, such as the African Convention of 1959. But also, I mean, more generally, uh, to me, I, I, I was relatively surprised by the focus on the right to life, because in reality, the major avenue in these uh, uh, kind of circumstances uh, uh, is the principle of non refoulement in case of torture, inhuman, and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, above all, degrading treatment. Because here, this is uh, uh, clearly uh, applicable, uh, absolute and applicable, uh, acknowledged uh, in the Global Compact and, uh, and uh, many other uh, binding instruments and non binding ones. So, uh, and uh, I don't know, I'm wondering what is the uh, purpose of such a focus on the risk of life with a relatively high threshold when compared to. Uh, 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 the, the, the broader version of the principle of uh, non refoulement in relation to inhuman or degrading treatment. Maybe do yeah. you have any thought about this? Because yeah, no, I I, I was just thinking now. For example, uh, there's less information available with regard to the tourist trade um, uh, petition, but uh, there. Are they frame the question also in terms of the right to be free from arbitrary interference with privacy, family, and home, uh, also the right to life, but also the right to culture. And in the, in the new petition, the, the, the Sachi and all the, in the human rights, uh, in the, the Commission, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, it's also uh, formulated more broadly. So I think it will be interesting to see uh, how also in, um, you know, how this um, uh, different petitions that I think they will be more frequent. They will start coming in a more frequent way, um, how they will be framed and what um, uh, rights will be invoked. Um, and I think 
Clearly, you know, you also have the question of uh, the economic, social, and cultural rights that are quite relevant um, in this matter. So I, I, uh, I think we'll have to see how this um, develops. It may depend a little bit on, the, you know, also how the, um, you know, the petitioner views the situation and the history behind each petition. And uh, uh, so it's difficult at this moment to draw conclusions, but I'm, I'm certain that in the next uh, few years we'll have a lot more um, cases of this type, um, and, and, and of course the treaty bodies will have an opportunity also to express um, their, their views. Thank you. Yes, and especially because in Emmanuel degraded treatment has a lower threshold that is plainly applicable to this kind of situation. So this is probably the more direct and strategic avenue mm -hmm. uh, not to develop some uh, uh, protection in this area. Uh, 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 last question, because I'm realizing that, uh, I mean, this is already the end. There was a question about, do, uh, are you aware about any case of, uh, 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 the question was, I want to know is the ILC has identified cases of sea level rise in South America, especially in Argentina. And at the moment we are um, looking um, and also asking states for um, those um, that input. I mean, there are areas of the globe that clearly uh, we know of, um, and, and the ones that I mentioned that are identified in the IPCC report, this last report. Um, uh, but in, specifically in Argentina, um, at the moment, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not aware. But I wanted to stress that, I mean, this is, of course, um, as they say, an existential threat Um, in, in, in different points of Asia, including, you know, China, Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, as, as we said, um, and in the Caribbean, of course, uh, uh, that's part also of the small islands um, uh, questions. But, um, but I think we are uh, really uh, trying to do this exercise of, um, you know, going around the globe, see what's happening. Um, we've been trying to um, promote um, states to contribute uh, to to our work. Um, of course, as you said, um, you know we base a lot of our work, uh, especially the part on codification on what states are doing. But of course, this kind of topic has an important dimension of progressive development. You know, it's clearly one uh, of those topics that um, has an important dimension of addressing new challenges to the international community. So clearly there's a certain important dimension of progressive development um, and, and not just mere codification. So it will be a mix of seeing what states are doing and uh, when what could be done and should be done. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you warmly uh, and congratulate you for this very uh, uh, interesting presentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to stop uh, now, but I mean, the number of questions indicates the importance of this topic and probably the need to come back here uh, at the Global Migration Center uh, when uh, uh, you will have the, the first draft of your report to discuss with, uh, uh, with colleagues, students, and the broader uh, audience uh, of, uh, uh, of the Global Migration Center. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you uh, today uh, with us.